Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your spirit that you have poured out upon us in our baptism. I pray that that same spirit rests upon us today and continues to reveal to us the truths of your word. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So last week we started a new teaching series called Q&A. And you know, really when you think about life, every day we're asked questions. And some of these are rather simple, straightforward questions. Like you bump into somebody else like, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? Or you're getting ready for supper as a family at night and somebody says, uh, do we have any barbecue sauce left? Yeah, go check the pantry for that. So some of the questions in life are, are rather simple and straightforward. And some of the questions that are asked of us are, they're stumpers. They're, they're a little bit more difficult for us, and we have to really wrestle with it. So last week, we launched this series, and I, I took to Facebook afterward, and I noticed that one of our members had, had posted some comments about the series, and, and he mentioned a question that had been posed to him. He said that there were a couple of people who were at work with him, and, and they knew that he was a strong Christian, and so they asked him this question. So when were you born again? Man, wasn't expecting that question. Like, what are you getting at? What does that mean? And and he was forced to pause and wrestle with that. I just flipped that question around on you this morning. When were you born again? How would you answer that? Now, you don't have to answer that question right here, right now, but we're going to wrestle with that question as we walk through our message this morning. Because that phrase, born again, it's not language that we use a lot as Lutherans. And sometimes it's loaded language in our culture. It has negative connotations surrounding it. Like this last Wednesday, we mentioned that this would be the question we'd be talking about this morning, and, and one of the families walked out of church and they said, that's not a term that I really like. Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit more. Where does that language of being born again originate? I think a lot of times in modern day America, we tend to associate this term with these two famous figures. One's a pastor and one's a politician. Billy Graham and President Jimmy Carter. So Billy Graham led a number of evangelistic crusades over the years, and at the end, he would always make an altar call, inviting people to come down to give their life to Christ, to have that personal relationship, and to be a born-again Christian. And I'm not knocking Billy Graham. I have a high level of respect for Billy Graham. I know that there are members of our congregation who have attended Billy Graham Crusades, and that has dramatically changed their life. My godmother worked for many years for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association when it was headquartered here in Minneapolis. So many times we think of Billy Graham associated with that phrase, born again. The other person that really brought that term, born again Christian, into prominence was President Jimmy Carter the 39th president of the United States of America. And when he ran for president back in 1975, part of his platform was he was very, very vocal that he was a born-again Christian. And I'm not knocking Jimmy Carter. He's an amazing man who has served not only as president of the United States, but very faithfully in his local Baptist congregation. In fact, well into his 90s, he was still teaching a Bible study. Can you imagine that? And yet now we're receiving that sad news that he has been placed on hospice care. But what I want you to know is that it's not Billy Graham and it's not President Jimmy Carter who originated that phrase, born again. It actually goes back to a conversation that Jesus had in John chapter 3 with a man named Nicodemus. And we're going to dig into that a little bit more in our time together this morning. So here's just a setup for where we're going. John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. So here's what we know about Nicodemus. 
Nicodemus was rich, he was religious, he was well-respected, and he was searching for reality. He really was that combination of a pastor and a politician. He was, he was a Pharisee. He was a religious teacher. He was prominent. He was, he was well-respected in that right. And he was also a member of the Jewish ruling council, or the Sanhedrin, which was a group of 70 who made up kind of like the Supreme Court. They were the ones who gave those final decisions regarding the law, what was right and what was wrong. And in the midst of Nicodemus' leadership, he hears about this, this new up-and-coming rabbi by the name of Jesus who is saying and doing all kinds of shocking things. And so he's intrigued. He's got a few questions for Jesus. So he intends to sit down and have a little Q&A session with Jesus, but, but not during the day because he's not sure how that would look to some of the other religious leaders. So he goes to him at night in order to have a private conversation with him. And yet, as he comes to have this private conversation, as he has all of these questions, Jesus flips the tables on him. Jesus redirects the conversation. Verse 3, Jesus says, truly, truly. By the way, when someone says truly, truly, when they repeat that word, they are trying to get your attention. This is when somebody stands up and they're like, all right, all right. Give me your attention. I got something important to say here. So Jesus says, truly, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God. No one can understand the things of God unless they are born again. And he introduces that phrase, which just completely catches Nicodemus off guard. Like, I'm not familiar with this language. What are you talking about, Jesus? How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. So Jesus begins to move toward an answer. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. So you should not be surprised by my saying, you must be born again. So there's Nicodemus, and there's Jesus, and you take this phrase in the middle, born again, and they are on completely different wavelengths at this moment. I don't know if you've ever had one of those conversations where you are saying something, and they are hearing what you're saying, but it's like, whoo, like you are ships passing in the night. You do not understand each other. This is where things stand at this moment. So what I'd like to do in the rest of our time together is I want to ask a series of questions around this phrase, born again, in order that we can get at an answer for the rest of us, when were we born again? And here's the first question. What does it mean to be born again? And Nicodemus and Jesus are in two different places when it comes to answering that question. Nicodemus is interpreting that from a literal perspective. He's like, uh, Like, how can I go back into the womb of my mother? Now, just just try to picture that for a moment. Like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. Okay, so it can't be literal. Jesus says it has to be spiritual. Because the Greek word for again can also be translated as above. What Jesus is saying is no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born from above, unless it's not merely an earthly birth, but it is a spiritual rebirth. And this is, this is language that has already been used in John's gospel, in the introduction to it in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. To those who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or of a husband's will. Like not literally born in that way, but born of God. Born from above. You track it. This this is a lot to digest. This is a lot for Nicodemus to digest. This is a lot for you and I to digest this morning as well. So so here's a, a related question then. Why? Why do you and I need to be born again? 
And Jesus dives into this in verse 6 as he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. So to understand here, when Jesus refers to flesh, and often when the Bible refers to flesh, it's not literally like just, just the flesh that clings to your bones, but he's talking about our sinful nature, our sinful flesh. Often as Lutherans, we'll talk about the enemies that we face in life as being the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. And this is what we've inherited from Adam. We have a fleshly, sinful nature, and that sin tends to skew our reality. Have you ever noticed that? Like, we tend to bury ourselves in our own selfish tendencies and our own lustful passions and pursuits. And in the end, what does it do? It kills us. Like, literally, it kills us. If we merely live by our flesh that we have an inherited from Adam, we end up dead. The Apostle Paul makes that very clear to us. So what do we need? Rather than just a first birth, we need a second birth. We need a spiritual rebirth. And that's what Jesus is hinting at here in John chapter 3 as he says, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. So you go all the way back to creation, And the Spirit is there hovering over the waters as God speaks things into existence, as God gives life. And then God forms Adam from the dust of the ground. And how does he bring life to him? It says he breathes, he gives his spirit, he breathes the breath of life into him. And so whereas sin skews our view of reality, now the Spirit straightens out our view of reality. It converts us, it regenerates us, it opens our eyes to see a reality, a reality where we are overwhelmed by the love of God, which is what Jesus can then go on to talk about with Nicodemus in John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever receives that new birth, will not perish, but will have eternal life. This is what the Spirit does. It takes the things from above, the things from God, that ultimate reality, which in our sinful nature we cannot see. The Spirit now intercedes in our lives and allows us to see those things. And so Paul can say these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things that God has revealed to us. How? By his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So what we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given to us. So once you see things, once the Spirit opens up another reality to you, you can't go back, you can't unsee it. So I was on the internet this last week, and I came across a a number of pictures that demonstrate this. Once you see this, you can't unsee it. So check this out. Here's the first picture. This is a drinking fountain. It has a drain, which looks exactly like the symbol for Wi-Fi. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Here's another one. This is a Toblerone chocolate bar. This is the logo. It's a mountain. But what's within the mountain? A bear. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Here's another one. This is the the Wendy's logo, and you can look at her collar. Do you see a word? Mom. It's there. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then one more. This is a a close-up of a caterpillar. Beautiful, intricate design. Somebody pointed out, If you look closely at it, I don't know, this might be stretching it a little bit, who knows, but sure looks like a penguin to me. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. 
It's the same thing for, from a spiritual standpoint. Like so often we can be walking around, walking through our lives, seeing things from a limited perspective. But then once the Holy Spirit intercedes and opens up God's word to us and we see that truth, we can't go back. We can't unsee what the Spirit reveals to us. So here's the question. How are we born again then? And Jesus answers with these words in verse 5. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless, this, this is what needs to happen, unless he is born of water and the Spirit. What's that a reference to? Water and the Spirit. Many biblical commentators, and I would tend to agree with them, believe that this is a reference to baptism. Because you can look at other scriptures, like Titus chapter 3, verse 5, which says this, He saved us through the washing of rebirth. So there's a reference of water, reference to water and another birth, and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. That's baptism. That's when we're reborn. That's why... As Vicar Josh said in his children's message, that's why we celebrate baptismal birthdays because that is a second birth. Our first birth is a fleshly birth into our earthly families. Our second birth is a spiritual birth as God pours out his spirit and offers the forgiveness of sins to us and open our eyes to see a new spiritual reality. And so when I read that Facebook post from one of our members where he was asked that question, when were you reborn? I was so proud of him because he said, it took me a while to think about this, but here's my response. He said to those two gentlemen who asked me about being born again, I say this now, every day I sin. Every day my heart is troubled. And yet every day I begin anew in baptism. Every day I come back to God with an open heart. I'm like, yes, yes, that's the answer. He goes back to his baptism, back to those promises from God's word. And here's what I love about that answer the onus is not on us. What role did you play in your first birth? How much did you contribute to that? Nothing. Your mom sure contributed a lot, but you didn't contribute anything. How much do you contribute to your second birth? Nothing. Because we are conceived and born in sin. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, Scripture says. And what can a dead person do? Nothing. They need an outside force. They need God's spirit to bring new life into them. That's what happens in baptism. Through water and the word, he works that faith in us. He raises us to new life and he regenerates us so that now we're able to take those things where we're like, oh, I don't get it, I don't understand that. We're now able to make sense of those things in Jesus. And guess what the result of that regeneration is? It's a reordered love in our lives. It's a changed life where those sinful passions and those lustly pursuits, we now look at them and we say, that's counterproductive. Like that, that no longer makes sense to me. So you look at this interchange in John chapter 3 between Nicodemus and Jesus and you say, did he ever get it? John chapter 3 doesn't give us an answer to that question. Jesus gives a response to Nicodemus, and then he just moves on to talking to someone else about something else, and Nicodemus just slips away. We, we don't know, at least here in John chapter 3, what happens to Nicodemus. We have to keep reading the entire gospel. And you get to John chapter 19, verses 38 and 39, and Nicodemus reinserts himself into the story. And now what is he doing? He's teaming up with a friend of his, Joseph of Arimathea, and they're taking Jesus' body down from the cross. And there's such a stark contrast between these two appearances of Nicodemus because the first one, he shows up in the middle of the night. He doesn't want to publicly associate with Jesus for fear of giving the wrong impression. But now we get to John chapter 19 and he shows up in public. He's not afraid to associate with Jesus. Why? Because I would argue he's been born again. Because his love has been reordered. 
So how would you answer that question? When were you born again? May you see that the answer is simply in your baptism. In your baptism, you were born of water and the Spirit. And may that Spirit continue to make sense of your life in Jesus as his love reorders your love. Amen.